So in our last segment of the larger lecture on the kind of politics of progressivism, um, we talked a bit about trust busting. But there were a number of other sort of progressive elements to the Roosevelt administrations. And one of those involves public health. Specifically, the passage in 1906 of the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act, two pieces of legislation that still impact our lives today. Every time you go to the grocery store, for instance, you may notice on your, on your meats that you purchase a stamp which suggests that the United States Department of Agriculture has, at least at some level, inspected this meat for purity, for treatment, for handling, and all those type things. We still have outbreaks of disease. Um, we're all aware of that. But this notion that the federal government has a role to play in inspecting something like meat reflects, one, the growing dependence or importance of the federal government in the everyday lives of Americans in the early 20th century, thanks to the progressives. But I think it also reflects the distance that many Americans now have from the things they use every day. And what I mean by that, very simply, is that there was a time when most Americans got their meat from local sources. Well, if we're having to worry about the condition of our meat, the treatment of our meat, where it's coming from, that suggests that already by the early 20th century, as people are moving to cities and taking industrial jobs and moving off the farm, they're increasingly dependent upon, upon chains of production and chains of provision that stretch longer distances. In other words, they are alienated from or separated from the source of their food. And that's a point well worth consideration. It reflects the changing economics and society of the United States by the late 19th and early 20th century. But back to these two acts that are passed in 1906, let me suggest that one of the factors leading to especially passage of the Meat Inspection Act was the publication in 1906 by a work called The Jungle from uh, Upton Sinclair. And it's very much an expose and a true muckraking progressive tradition. It's an expose about the stockyards and the meatpacking industry of Chicago. And I want to read a, a brief passage, relatively brief passage, and I want to forewarn you, it's relatively graphic, fairly vulgar, and not something you might want to hear if you're eating something. Well, Sinclair writes this, quote, there was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. There would be, or there would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected and that was moldy and white. It would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor in the dirt and the sawdust where the workers had tramped and spit uncounted billions of tuberculosis germs. There would be meat stored in great piles in rooms and the water from leaky roofs would drip and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances and the packers would put poison bread out for them and the rats would die and then rats, poison bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. It's a really pleasant picture, but you gotta kind of imagine what impact that had on people reading Sinclair, reading reports in newspapers about where their meat was coming from, how it was treated, and what it most likely contained. It makes sense then that in 1906, Congress would respond with federal intervention, certainly in the progressive era, which relied so heavily on this notion of federal intervention and the use of government for so many ends. But it's the Pure Food and Drug Act I guess I need to tell you about. Meat inspection makes a lot of sense. Understand that exposés were showing too 
that America's medicines and cosmetics were themselves adulterated and often poorly handled and unhygienic. Understand that what the new law of 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act, required was that the federal government enforce laws which required manufacturers to put ingredients, especially narcotics and other drugs, onto labels to make sure that consumers knew what was there. Understand that there was an effort in place to remove those elements that could be considered extraordinarily dangerous. It was not uncommon, for instance, for producers of medicines, sometimes cures, to use stuff like cocaine or mercury or other ingredients that particularly in large doses could be highly addictive or worse yet could lead to death. It's in that spirit that Congress acts during the Roosevelt administration. Now, it doesn't completely outlaw practices. Instead, like Roosevelt generally and sort of progressives generally, what we see here is a middle way. Government's going to have a role. Government's going to have enforcement. But we're not simply telling producers what they may do. It has to do with letting the people know, understand, freedom of information, those type of things. Another area where Roosevelt's sort of middle way and the progressive middle way seems to come out, at least so it seems to me, is in how Roosevelt handled the issue of labor, these sort of radicals of the underclass. In 1902, Roosevelt faced a strike in the coal fields by, among others, the United Mine Workers. Roosevelt's first response was a response of investigation. He wanted to turn the issue over uh, to experts. And ultimately, he wanted to avoid outright conflict and use the experts to bring about arbitration of the difficulties, the issues that separated employer from employee. The mine workers in the anthracite fields, uh, from Pennsylvania all the way out to Colorado, mine workers wanted higher wages and they wanted a restriction to an eight-hour day, a limitation on hours. But the owners not only refused to consider the demands of the workers, more importantly, the owners rejected any discussions with the union. They rejected the notion of collective bargaining. You may think about this, and it's going to continue after Roosevelt, by the way. It's not just something he solves and then the problem of collective bargaining goes away. No, no, it's, it's, it's more of a matter where we've seen over and over how employers reject collective bargaining. They reject unions or unionization. Well, that's what happens in this case. The owners refuse to deal with an agent for the workers, for the miners. But Teddy Roosevelt is faced with a dilemma of his own because America relies on coal. If coal's not dug and made available, the public relations nightmare will be for Teddy Roosevelt, president, you know, who's supposed to be out doing and protecting the interests of the American people. Roosevelt threatens uh, to utilize federal troops to reopen closed mines around the country. But ultimately what he does is to force the mine owners to accept arbitration, arbitration by a commission. Nobody gets everything they want. It's the middle way, after all. Workers get a raise, but it's not the raise that they'd wanted. They get a shorter working day of nine hours, but not the eight hours for which they ask. And the owners are not forced to recognize the union or the right of workers to bargain collectively, but they do have to deal with the union and its representatives and the workers, in part by the creation of a grievance committee. Roosevelt declares this moderate sort of middle way where no side gets what it wants, a square deal. In other words, 
the sides are all equal all around the table. It's a square. Thus, this notion of the square deal. Another area that I think is worth noting in terms of the Roosevelt presidency is conservation. It may not seem like progressives, especially urban progressives, would be overly concerned with the natural world, with nature, which is a fascinating concept in itself from a cultural perspective. I mean, after all, nature has been defined and redefined over the course of human history. When the first Puritans uh, came over to New England, and if you've read, of course, uh, books like The Scarlet Letter later on, and even into the antebellum period, you get this sense that the wilderness represented something to be feared, an idea that traces its, its roots probably all the way back to um, Europe and medieval Europe in particular, when you've got stories like Little Red Riding Hood and all that. But this idea that the forest or the wilderness is something to be feared, it's dark, it's unknown, uncivilized, it's not town, it's not settled, it's where the Native Americans live. We certainly get that in the Scarlet Letter. But consider that by the early 20th century, after Frederick Jackson Turner has talked about the end of the frontier, wilderness is no longer something that's out there that's threatening so much as it's something that's disappearing. And what was once considered threatening rapidly becomes instead something that may have to be preserved, that's dwindling. But consider too that nature has become as well a commodity. That means something to be bought and sold, something that has an abstract value. It's not just a tree, a thing that may be beautiful. It's a matter of bored feet. It's a matter of how much lumber you can get out of that tree. And for Americans watching the wilderness sort of drift away or decline or fade, one of the questions that had to be asked was, how much longer will these resources, these commodities be available if we use them all up? Using his presidential authority over the courses, a course of his administration, Theodore Roosevelt added approximately 150 million acres to America's national forests, along with other tracts of coal and uh, water lands. 1902 would see passage of the National Reclamations or Newland Act. And this act, sponsored by Senator Francis Newlands, or Newland, sorry, of Nevada, set aside the proceeds of Western land sales to finance things like irrigation and river control. This is very much a part of Western settlement but it also affords opportunities, not only to bring new lands into cultivation, but to look toward the protection of resources in terms of watersheds. In other words, a rationalization in terms of watersheds and timber resources for preserving or at least conserving certain land for the future. It's actually a really fascinating story about a gentleman, a person by the name of Gifford Pinchot, who will become affiliated with this conservation of America's sort of wild lands. He was America's first professionally trained forester and would go on to become, under Roosevelt, go on to become the chief of the United States Forest Service. Pinchot represented scientific forestry. Again, the notion of the expert, the notion of progressivism itself. And he believed that the whole question of 
Conservation was a practical one. It was a matter of management. Put another way, and, and maybe a better way, when you think about environmental protection, you're not just thinking about environmentalism, but there are different facets. And really, people mean different things, even though they're using the same word, right? The environment and environmental protection or environmentalism. On the one hand, there's the attitude that things must be preserved because they represent nature, because they're beautiful, whatever it may be. They must be preserved intact as they are, as they would be without human intervention, without signs of humans' presence. On the other hand, farther end of the spectrum is this notion, use it all. It's there for human use. It's there as a commodity. It's there to be used. Use it. Don't protect it in any way. So you've got complete protection, no humans. And then you've got on the other end, humans with minimal protection. And then you've sort of got this middle way. And that's where Gifford Pinchot comes in. That's where scientific forestry comes in because the idea becomes one of management. And the question becomes, how can we not protect the land untainted, but how can we manage the resources of the land in such a way as to maintain those resources for the future, for future generations of Americans, for the future national good and national interest. One of the areas that becomes very touchy for Gifford Pinchot is the Hetch Hetchy Valley. It's an area that under uh, the National Reclamation Act is set to be dammed and flooded and the question is one, again, of conservation, preservation, or just sheer use. Pinchot comes down in the middle, sort of, though some might disagree, I suppose, with that interpretation. But the argument that's made regarding Hetch Hetchy and the creation of this body of water and the destruction of the nature, the natural world that will go beneath that water is really about use. It's really about the needs of humanity. And I'm not suggesting here that I'm a great fan of Pinchot. He's a fascinating character, well worth study, and I suggest if you have a chance you read more about early environmental thinking in the United States, and the world for that matter. But I am suggesting that Pinchot here, who is that sort of hand-picked individual by Theodore Roosevelt, by a progressive president, like Roosevelt reflects this middle way, management, oversight, efficiency, not extremes. And that, to my mind, is very much in keeping with the progressive idea, the middle class attitudes that lay beneath progressive ideas.